Good morning. Have a cup of coffee, big old cup of water. We're just going to hang out, play some magic. Um, yeah. So my partner started a new work schedule and it's working on Saturday mornings. So I'm going to stream some magic on Saturday mornings and just chill and wake up a bit and, and chat and um yeah for the time being i'm gonna be doing this every saturday wake up with y'all and and go over some why am i on this page get that away um yeah there was one thing i wanted to do this morning in particular because where is my browser? Boom. Okay. So I wanted to open that up, but I want to crop this. Uh, 300. And then we'll crop it on the right side. A little bit more. Yeah, that looks about right. I'll make it as big as I can. And we will that away. Okay. Well, actually, you know what? Probably make this real big. Okay, so there is a new set coming to Arena only, and it is called Jumpstart Historic Horizons. And there's a couple things that wizards are doing that are special with this set. One is this is a digital only set and it's the first time they've ever released something um, for arena only that's not going to have a physical cardboard copy. And the reason why they're not doing physical cards for this set is because they're introducing a couple of new mechanics that are digital only because they are too complicated or would be too frustrating to try to keep track of um, in paper magic. And they're trying to get more people into the arena scene and get people collecting on there and playing on there more often. So it's, I don't, I don't hate the move. I think it's, it's a little, the, the only thing I have a problem with is that magic doesn't tie in the paper with the arena as as often as they should in order to get more people playing arena they should be including codes in every single product that they sell in paper even if i buy one booster pack just give me a code for one booster pack in arena and that's automatically going to make people click over um open the game check it out <clears throat> And so now they're doing this Jumpstart Historic Horizons, which uh, is launching in, I think in just a few days. No, it's the seventh today. It's launching at the end of the month, I believe. Uh, oh, no, it says right there, August 12th. So that is, yeah, just a few days. The 12th is next Thursday. So for next weekend, Histor Historic Horizons, Will be out um let's i wanted to take a quick peek at the new to magic cards there is a handful of cards that have never been in magic before and i'm not going to go over the entire uh jumpstart historic horizons packet list but i will go over these new to magic cards um as you can see here new to magic these cards have never been in the game before, and they come with some very interesting 
uh, mechanics. So arriving on October or August 12th on Magic Arena, Jumpstart Historic Horizons adds hundreds of new cards from the Modern Horizons, Modern Horizons 2, and beyond. Plus, all new Magic the Gathering cards to, to Magic Arena. Um, Modern Horizons and Modern Horizons 2 are, were two very successful Paper Magic um, blocks, and they brought a lot of really great stuff from the history of Magic from the late 90s, early 2000s. They avoided bringing in a bunch of overpowered historic cards, but it is very intriguing to see that they are jumping on board with how popular that was and bringing some of this stuff to Arena. So if you want to see the full deck list, um, hold on, let me, I will copy this. I will put the link in the description of this video when it goes on YouTube. We'll put the link in chat right now. Uh, below you will find card images for the new to magic cards exclusive to this digital release updated the day after they are previewed. So for the last few weeks, they've been doing some preview stuff uh, with some of the magic cre content creators. Uh, one, hold on one sec. Okay, so, <clears throat> pardon me, um, and then after this we'll, we'll probably go over the couple of Innistrad cards that they previewed the other day, because Wizards is moving real fast and putting out new content every 30 seconds. So, let's go over these cards. New to Magic. Um, they've separated it by color, so we'll just go from top to bottom. We've got white. We've got baffling defenses. Oh, you can't see my mouse. Can I change that? Browser. Properties. Capture cursor. Oh, this is on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Baffling defenses. For one and a white, it's an instant. Target creature's base power perpetually becomes zero. So this is one of the new mechanics that they're introducing in... Uh, jumpstart Historic Horizons. Mo is that what they're calling it? Yeah, Historic Horizons. And it's this word, perpetually. So, unlike Paper Magic, where it's hard to keep track of counters and power increases, buffs and debuffs throughout the game, um, most of the time when you're playing Paper Magic and you put a 1-1 counter on somebody, when that creature leaves the battlefield or dies or however it leaves the battlefield that counter comes off of that creature so if you were to recast it it would no longer have that one one counter on it it would be the standard base power and toughness of the card but this perpetually <clears throat> this new mechanic in jumpstart historic horizons that's only going to be an arena means that the power of that card forever is changed to zero while until the game is over once the game is over and you restart a new game it will um go back to its normal power and toughness uh, this card just affects the power base so you don't have to worry about its toughness so for one and a white you get to make a creature have zero power period for the rest of the game and that's pretty powerful because if you're patient and you hold on to this card for the right moment you can change your opponent's most powerful creature to have zero power it might have a lot of toughness still but uh if someone plays a tiamat and you play this card all of a sudden tiamat becomes zero power and if Tiamat dies, and they bring Tiamat back from the graveyard, it's still going to have zero power, because it perpetually becomes zero. <clears throat> uh, next we've got Benelish Partisan. 
One and a white for a human soldier creature with lifelink. Whenever you cycle another card, you may pay one and a white. If you do, turn Benelesh Partisan from your graveyard. Return Benelesh Partisan from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and it perpetually gets one plus one plus zero. So this is interesting because obviously aggro white and lifelink is a big deal. Um, some people really like to take advantage of cycling powers. And this cycling power just continuously adds plus one to the power of the card. And again, you've got that word perpetually, which is the new mechanic in this um, sense, in this case. And so perpetually it gets plus one plus zero. So every single time you do it, it goes up one toughness or one power. Uh, so that can get pretty scary, especially because the cycling cost is just one and a white. Um, so you pay one and a white to cycle it, which means it goes, uh, goes away, goes into your graveyard. Um, and then you may pay a one and a white again. So all in all, you're looking at a one and a white to play it, one and a white to cycle it, and one and a white to return it from the graveyard. So it's a pretty hefty cost to do the full circle, but... Every single time you do it, you get plus one, plus zero until the end of the game. Which is pretty crazy. I really like this perpetually mechanic. It's going to make some things intriguing. Next up, we've got Leonon, Leonin Sanctifier, which is a one and a white cat cleric with lifelink. Uh, base power is two, base toughness is one. When Leonin Sanctifier enters the battlefield, choose a creature card in your hand and it perpetually gets lifelink. So this is interesting, again, for those mono white aggro decks where, you know, lifelink is, is really powerful, especially if you've got some stuff um, like some of the other clerics that you put down um, that gain one one counters every single time you gain life. This is really interesting because you can give something that doesn't have lifelink, lifelink for the rest of the game. <clears throat> it, one thing actually, thinking about it now, one thing it does change up is that instead of having to find ways to... Um, sometimes when, when a card like this, the ETB is choose creature card in your hand and perpetually gains lifelink, Something like this, a lot of players would find a way to return it to your hand and play it again so you can give something else lifelink and return it and play it and return it and play it. And this is interesting because the perpetually mechanic means that if you were to return it to your hand and play it over and over again, you're looking at you know, being able to put lifelink on all your creatures, for instance. And so it's very interesting. I'm very excited to see what some of the more... Uh, macro magic players do with stuff like perpetually um, mechanic cards like this lifelink or perpetually gets one zero or perpetually turns base power to zero. I'm excited to see what um, some of the more crazy players get up to. Next up we've got Lumbering Light Shield which is one in a white for an illusion creature. Uh, and it's 1-4. When Lumbering Light Shield ETBs enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals a non-land card at random from their hand. It perpetually gains this spell costs one more to cast. So this is another of the new mechanics coming in Historic Horizons, which is randomization. Uh, when you're playing Paper Magic, it's really hard to kind of randomize some things. Oh. My mom just texted me and told me to scroll. You can say that in chat. I don't know if you're at your computer or anything, but. Um, so when it enters the battlefield, the target opponent, so you get to choose which opponent if you're playing commander or multiplayer, two-headed giant. And they reveal a non-land card at random. So in arena, because it's a computer program, the game's going to just choose one at random. So it will cycle through all the numbers behind the scenes and pick a card. There's a couple of things which we'll get into um, 
shortly here with these other cards where, you know, instead of pulling a chosen card from your library, which a lot of cards have done in Magic Past, um, this new random mechanic will mean that you'll choose a random card from your library, which adds a little bit of excitement. It could get spicy. And so this guy's really interesting. I kind of wish it had flash, to be honest. It is an illusion, and normally illusions, sometimes, not normally, sometimes illusions have flash, so I, I kind of wish it had flash. But it's, it's very interesting because, again, it's only a one and a white. So if you wanted to cycle it and bring it out of your hand, out of the battlefield and play it again and bring it out and play it again, you could make, you can make some of these, your opponent's spells cost a lot more mana, especially if you can do it all in one turn, because the randomizer might pick the same card more than once. So that's intriguing. And then again, it says perpetually, so for the rest of the game, that spell is going to cost one more mana for every time Lumbering Light Shield enters the battlefield. Next up, we've got Teo, Aegis Adept, which is a two white white Planeswalker who enters with four loyalty. Uh, can I make this bigger? No. Oh, I can zoom in though. Okay, up to, so his plus one is up to one target creature's base power perpetually becomes equal to its toughness. So if you're playing, say, the Lumbering Light Shield right here, um, well, I guess zooming in is making it difficult. If you play Lumbering Light Shield right here and you use Tails plus one, then his power will perpetually become four. It basically, it brings up the power to match the toughness. So you want to get those creatures that have a huge toughness counter. I'm thinking about like my Demir Rogues deck where I have a bunch of um, Ruin Crabs. Those guys are zero threes. If I have Teo, I can make them all three threes, which is very interesting. And that's his plus one. So you're gaining loyalty with that. The minus two is conjure a lumbering light shield card onto the battlefield. So this is intriguing too because you're conjuring and conjuring picks particular cards out of your library. Um, and so, like I said, the, the lumbering light shield, if you were to do the minus two, conjure one from your library onto the battlefield and then next turn do the plus one, all of a sudden you've got a four four and it's and it's pretty pretty gravy. You can do that a few times, especially if you have, if you're playing standard and you have a full playset of lumbering light shields in your library. I believe the conjure mechanic means that it pulls from your library. I'm just gonna check that real quick. Um. Creates a card out of thin air. Oh. I don't have a lot of patience the cards that can be conjured can include cards that aren't in the same set or the format for that matter. Whoa. So you can pull things out of the format, which is interesting. I think this card isn't going to be legal in standard for... Uh, digital magic because that's a little fucked up to be honest so once you get up to six loyalty or higher you can do his minus six ability which is you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step return target white creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield you gain life equal to its toughness so that's a pretty steep and crazy powerful um, ultimate ability if you're playing against someone who has a Teo on board, do not let them get that. Because every single end step, they will be able to return a white creature from their graveyard and gain life. So, if you don't get rid of the emblem, you, you will be screwed. It will, it will get out of hand very fast. 
So the last one we have for white, for the new to magic cards, is the Wingsteed Trainer, which is a three and a white for a human creature with a two, three power toughness. When Wingsteed Trainer enters the battlefield or attacks, conjure a Stormfront Pegasus card into your hand. So there's that conjure mechanic again, which is creating a card out of thin air. So it's, it doesn't count in your, um, in your 99, it doesn't count in your 60 card deck if you're playing standard or historic. Um, these conjure cards do not have to be included in your card list. And this card will conjure one out of thin air, which again is very difficult in paper magic. I mean, we could, players like having sideboards. I love having sideboards, so we could just add more cards to our sideboard or, or have, uh, a tokens and a conjure pile off to the side. I think it's doable in Paper Magic. It's just so much easier in Arena where... Um, is that the song with the fucking alarm? Go away. I don't want alarms going off. Me. PTSD. Um, so yeah, that's, that's very interesting the conjure mechanic this one brings in a stormfront pegasus which is let me just find take a look at this stormfront pegasus so stormfront pegasus is a 2-1 flying creature which is fine you get some flying damage it's not the greatest damage but you get it for free. Yeah, when you when Wingsteed Trainer ETBs, you get a uh, Stormfront Pegasus for free. If you were to have a full playset of trainers, then all of a sudden you play four trainers, you have eight creatures on the battlefield, and that is when your opponent concedes. All right, so we're moving on to blue, which I'm excited about. The first one is Bounty of the Deep. It's a two and a blue for a sorcery. If you have no land cards in your hand, which let's be honest, happens a lot, seek a land card and a non-land card. Otherwise, seek two non-land cards. So this is a draw two, sort of. It's a seek two. If you, if you have no lands, you get a land and something else. If you, do, if you do have a land, you get two of something else. And I'm just going to quickly make sure I have the... Um, verbiage down for the seek mechanic. Okay, yeah. So, just to clarify, seeking is a tutor ability. Um, and tutoring is when you can search your library for a specific card. Lots of cards do tutor, have tutor abilities in Magic these days. But seeking is random. So if you were to get a, say you had no land cards in your hand, you play Bounty of the Deep, which is only two and a blue for two cards, which is pretty good. If you have no land cards in your hand, you will get a land card and a non-land card. So you don't get to pick what land. So if you're running a five color deck and you really need that last blue to summon a dragon or something, um, you don't get to choose. Seeking is random. So it will give you one random land card and one random non-land card, which could be anything. Uh, sorcery, instant, planeswalker, creature, artifact. As long as it's not a land, it counts. And there are some seeking abilities that are a bit more specific in terminology for what they're seeking. Uh, but this one is very vague and open, so... It's basically two and a blue for two random cards. One of them might be a land, depending on your hand. Which isn't the worst. Sometimes you can pull... I mean, this is the Hail Mary of blue decks. If you're really looking for an answer, Bounty of the Deep might give it to you. So the next up is Ethereal Grasp, which is two and a blue for an instant. Tap target creature. 
that creature perpetually gains this creature doesn't untap during your next untap step and what is that symbol I can't tell what that is let me just look it up on gatherer ethereal grasp ethereal grasp what no card Eth ethereal grasp images the same symbol? No. Uno Memento. Is that an A? Or an R? Or is that a person icon? What does that mean? Okay, it seems like it might be an eight, which I don't think so, but consensus on Reddit is that it's an eight. It is very difficult to tell from this photo. Is it a ribbon? No, it's not a ribbon. Um, yeah, I don't, it might be sacrifice a creature. Uh, oh. Can't find the chat. What are you watching it on? Oh, well, hold on. We don't, I don't have to have this conversation out loud. Okay, so the next one up is, uh, Kiora. Kiora, the Tide's Fury. She's three and a blue for a legendary planeswalker with four loyalty. Her plus one is conjure a Kraken Hatchling card into your hand. So, Kiora is a must for Kraken decks. Period. Just saying it right now. She has another plus one, which is untapped target creature. Found it. All right. So her other plus one is untapped target creature or land. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to and dealt by that permanent until your next turn. So you get to tap something and remove it from combat or negate any of its damage, which is pretty good. I think if you, if you hold off on playing that plus one until your opponent reveals their attack strategy then you can use that her minus three uh which you can do right out the gate because she comes in with four so her ultimate is a little sus you sacrifice a kraken if you do create an eight eight blue kraken creature token so there's a lot of krakens there's little krakens uh, kraken tentacles Anything that says Kraken on it as a creature type, you can sacrifice and you instantly get an 8-8 Kraken token, which is pretty cool. I think this is going to be a lot of fun and it's going to be a standard in people's Kraken decks, especially if you're playing Commander. Because then you don't have to worry about Kraken hatchlings. You get to just put them in your hand. The next one up is Mentor of Evo's Isle. It's two and a blue. 
This one is on my must watch list because it's very interesting if you play blue heavy deck um if you're playing a heavy control deck i don't think i would put it in my rogues deck just because the creature type isn't right if it was a uh, bird rogue or or something that i could find more synergy with i would put it in my demir deck so it's two and a blue for creature bird wizard with 2-1 power toughness. It has flying, but when Mentor of Evil's Isle ETBs enters the battlefield, choose a creature card in your hand so the player doesn't know what you're choosing, and it perpetually gains flying. This is again the perpetual rule where you can give any card in your hand the, ab the flying ability, which means it can only be blocked by other flyers, um, or creatures with reach and this is very intriguing it's a little more expensive than I'd want a 2-1 to be 2-1 flyer to be but with that enter the battlefield um, ability it's it's pretty good I feel like if you have a full playset of Evo's Isle mentors you know you go from having four flyers on the battlefield to eight flyers on the battlefield um, in a few turns just because you've given everything in your hand flying which is awesome next up is shoreline scout which is one blue for a creature merfolk scout with one one power toughness so cheap cost cheap chump blocker merfolk scout so it might fit into your merfolk decks all you merfolk folk out there when Shoreline Scout enters the battlefield, you may exile a Merfolk card or land card from your hand. If you do, conjure a Tropical Island card into your hand. So this is getting rid of a land or another Merfolk, which, I mean, you'd want to probably get rid of one of these guys because they're cheap and they're just chump blockers. And if you do that, um, exile a merfolk or land you get a tropical island card which is something I don't know tropical island oh let's add green or blue that's interesting so you can get rid of a, a creature or a land card and you get a dual land which is awesome um, and then she's got more on here. As long as another merfolk or island entered the battlefield under your control this turn, Shoreline Scout gets one plus one plus zero. So it doesn't say perpetually, but as long as they're on the battlefield, you can continue to put plus one counters on its power. The last blue card that's new to magic is the Tomb Tome of the Infinite. For two and a blue it's a legendary artifact and its ability is you pay a blue and tap it to conjure a random card from tome of the infinite spell book into your hand it perpetually gains you you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast this spell so whatever spell you pull out of the book welcome Ooh. to the hamlet thank you so much for following manolia I appreciate it. Um, so we... So whatever spell... Okay, th I know there's a list somewhere. This card has a list of spells. Is it at the bottom? Yes. So, Tome of the Infinite. It's two and a black. Legendary artifact. You pay it one blue and tap. And it conjures one of these cards at random from outside the game. You don't have to have these in your deck. They're not part of your 60 or 99. Um, I keep saying part, not part of your 99, but there's no official commander in arena. So wizards can fucking get their shit straight. Uh, so blue and a tap, and you can't conjure one of these random ones. And they are some pretty great spells these are these are standard spells ponder 
Uh, swords to plowshares is used in almost every single white non-standard deck I've ever played against or watched play. Uh, stuff like Light of Hope is great. Um, everything on this list is awesome. Dark Ritual is fantastic. Duress is something I enjoy screwing around with. Um, if you're Red Aggro, Lightning Bolt, Assault Strobe. Green's got Giant Growth and Fog, which completely prevents all damage in combat. So for one mana, you get one of those powerful cards, one of those powerful instants, and they're all, they're all one mana cards. So it looks like they've chosen an instant and a sorcery for every color. Oh, no, white has two instants. Um, and that card, so say, say you paid your one blue and tapped your um, Tome of the Infinite. If you drew Sword of the Plowshares, which is a one white mana, this card perpetually gets, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast this spell. So you don't have to worry about putting white or random color mana in your deck at all. Everything on this list will get that buff when you draw it. And then if it gets destroyed or you, you play it and it goes to your graveyard, which I believe conjured cards go into your graveyard, they might actually exile. But either way, if, if you have the opportunity to play it again, um, that card is still going to have the buff that you may spend a mana as though it were any color to cast the spell. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. So that's really intriguing. I think this is going to be a... Um, Definitely a standard in aggro decks. Definitely a standard in um, rogue decks, I think. I think two and a blue. I will easily remove some stuff from my deck to put that in there because I don't have a lot of removal. I don't have a lot of kill spells. Um, I do have some graveyard plucking. I do have some... Stainful Stroke, I have uh, Murder, some of the more common black and blue aggro cards, but this gives me access to a bunch more that I would never put in my deck because they're white and green and red. So that's extremely, extremely cool. But we're going to move on to black which I'm also pretty excited about. So the first one we have here is Boneyard Aberration, which is four and a black. So it's an expensive skeletal dog. When Boneyard Aberration dies, exile it. If you do, conjure three reassembling skeleton cards into your graveyard. Reassembling skeletons are cards that you can pay mana cost to cast from your graveyard so the reason why this 3-3 skeletal dog is so expensive is because you get a 3-3 on the battlefield which is fine 3-3 three is not too bad but when it dies you get three other cards in your graveyard that you can cast almost immediately if you have the mana that's very intriguing I don't think I'm putting it in my deck because I might put it in my skeletons deck but I don't have a ton of fun playing that so it's an exciting card it's just not for me the next up is Davriel Soul Broker who's two and two black two black black for a legendary planeswalker with four loyalty default his plus one is until your next turn, whenever an opponent attacks you and or planeswalker you control, they discard a card. If they can't, they have to sacrifice an attacking creature. Which is great. It's a plus one, you're going to want to hit that a few times, right? And people are going to think twice about attacking you while you have that buff up. And it lasts until your next turn, right? 
until your next turn. Yeah. So his minus two is accept one of Davriel's offers, then accept one of Davriel's conditions. Now we're going to go over that in a sec because this is kind of like the um, tome we were talking about earlier up here that has a list, has a separate list. Um, so let's go to his, his minus three is target creature perpetually gets minus three, minus three. So assuming you're plus oneing this for, let's say four or five rounds, if your game is taking a while, you can give a few creatures one at a time, minus three, minus three for the rest of the game. You can all of a sudden make someone's really aggro, really great board look weak and be ineffectionate and not really worthwhile. So this could turn the tide. I think people are going to sacrifice, uh, not sacrifice. I think people are going to aim for Davriel as soon as they see it because, and we'll check this out in a second because of his minus two ability. So for minus two, you accept one of Davriel's offers, then you accept one of Davriel's conditions. And we're gonna scroll down to the bottom here again. So this is Davriel here. So, you will get, when you play this card in game, it's not gonna show you this whole list. It's gonna pick three of these at random and show them on the screen as three options and you're going to get to pick one of them so davriel will offer you three choices from the options below and you have to choose one you could draw three cards you could conjure a manor guardian card into your hand you can return two random creature cards from your graveyard to your hand and they perpetually gain one one which this is really great, especially if you're running a Skeletons Zombies deck because you're going to have a bunch of creatures in your graveyard. You could return a random creature card with the highest mana value from among your cards in your graveyard to the battlefield, so not to your hand. They don't get the buff, the 1-1, one, one, like the last option did, and you only get to do one of them, but they go straight from the graveyard to the battlefield. Another option is you get an emblem with creatures you control get plus two plus zero. So an emblem is uh, an enchantment which can be destroyed. They're not permanent. So you wait, can you? I'm, I'm just going to make sure. I'm still fairly new at magic. I'm still trying to make sure. Oh, it's not an enchantment. An emblem is not a permanent and absolutely nothing can touch it or get rid of it as long as the player who gained it remains in the game. Huh. All right, well, I learned something new today. interesting so we were here you get an emblem with creatures you control get plus two plus zero so obviously you have to go you have to have the four mana to play davriel and you can minus two right away because he starts with four loyalty and you can get uh, an emblem that gives everything you ever play on the battlefield plus two plus zero or you can choose to get an emblem with spells you cast cost X less to cast. Which I don't know. I'm assuming that's loyalty to black. I'm not sure. Or maybe it's one black. No, I think it's one black. So you get... This, the second choice for emblems, which is, again, like we just learned, a permanent that's going to buff you for the rest of the game. Um, spells you cast cost one black less to cast, which is great. There's a lot of really low to medium black um, spell cards. All your creatures, all your instants, all your murders. Everything costs one less to cast if it has a black. If... 
if you were to use that emblem to cast Davriel, it would cost two and a black. So you get rid of one of these blacks for everything in your deck, which is pretty cool. Another emblem choice you've got is Devriel Planeswalkers you control have plus two draw a card. So this changes the card, which is super interesting. Again, you're going to get three of these choices and you out of the whole list and you have to pick one of them. So this option with Davriel Planeswalkers you control have plus two. If you were to choose that immediately, this card, because it's already on your battlefield, would get a plus two draw card power. It's like it's free card draw every turn for plus two loyalty. And then you can do another offer or target creature gets perpetual minus three minus three. That's a pretty that's a pretty cool one. The last emblem you can choose is whenever you draw a card, you gain two life, which is also pretty neat. Not a lot of black cards focus on life gain. So that's interesting. So those are his offers. When you do his minus two, you have to accept one of his offers and accept one of his conditions. So he's going to give you a soul contract because he's a soul broker. So now we go to the negatives. So Davriel will require you to choose one condition from among three of the options below. So just like the positive conditions, the offers, you're going to get three of these at random when you play that, that power, when you do his minus two ability. His conditions are... One, you lose six life, which could be tough, but you'll have two other choices if that pops up. Another option is, another condition, is exile two cards from your hand. If fewer than two cards were exiled this way, each opponent gets to draw cards equal to the difference. So, say you have no cards in your hand. You're completely you're top decking it for the rest of the game, probably. If this option comes up, you have to select it because the other two options say will kill you or ruin the rest of your game for you. Um, so you don't have anything to exile. And that means both all of your opponents, if you're playing more than one or just your single opponent, get to draw two cards for free just because you didn't have anything in your hand this is what is interesting about this card is because you get a positive and you have to accept a negative you need better lawyers uh, the third option is sacrifice two permanents which you know could be the best option say you have 10 land then you don't need 10 land for anything because you have this one up here where spells cost you one black less um, you can sacrifice a couple lands or or a low power creature or something uh, another condition is each creature you don't control perpetually gets plus one plus one so this is buffing your enemy's creatures again none of these are positive these are all conditions to the offers that are, were above that were all positive the next option is you get an emblem with creatures you control get minus one minus zero so for the rest of the game everything you control has one less power does one less damage which kind of sucks but if we scroll up if you choose this offer creatures you control get plus two plus zero that's permanent for the rest of the game that's an emblem and then you choose this condition it evens it's like it's a net positive all your creatures will get plus one plus zero which is intriguing that's that's an offer and condition i'm willing to take the next one is spells cost one black more to cast instead of one black less so say you're still in that position again where you have a ton of mana and 
maybe you're not scared of some of the cards you're picking up and everything in your hands looking low mana cost, you might select this condition just to get something good out of the buff. The last one, or not, not last one, second to last one, is you get an emblem with whenever you draw a card, exile the top two cards from your library. So you draw one, and then you have to exile two. Not my favorite, that scares me a little bit. And the last one is you get an emblem with at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose a life for each creature you control. <laughs> That's brutal, okay. Okay. The opposite of that in the positive category is whenever you draw a card, gain two life. So whenever, at the beginning of your upkeep, which is every turn, you lose one life for each creature you control. So you don't want to have creatures on the battlefield, which is fucking weird. Your goal is to not have anything on the battlefield. Cool. We're playing magic now. So that is the black planeswalker card. Davriel soul broker, very complicated minus two ability, but it's very interesting. And I think it's gonna throw things into weird loops and, and, and make some games very exciting that maybe wouldn't have been exciting otherwise. The next black card, new to magic, is Davriel's Withering, which is a one black instant. Target creature perpetually gets minus one, minus two. So again, like that white, um, baffling defenses perpetually becomes zero power. This is a permanent debuff to a card, most likely your opponent's card, because I don't see a scenario where you want to play this yourself on yourself. Um, so that's cool. It's good to have, good to add in black, especially because there's lots of poisons and, and, and debuffs in black that kind of fit this theme. The next one is Manor Guardian. So this is one of those, um, where was the Manor Guardian? Was that in Davriel's Conditions? Yeah, conjure a Manor Garden, Guardian into your hand. So this is the card you can conjure, which again, conjuring doesn't means it doesn't have to be in your deck. So Manor Guardian is a two and a black for a demon creature with four power, three toughness. It's pretty good for a three mana, three cost. When Manor Guardian dies, each player seeks a non-land card with mana value two or less. So this is equally as good for you as it is for your opponents. Because every player gets to pick, they don't pick actually, they get to grab a non-land card with mana cost two or less from their deck at random and the computer's going to do all that for you so it's just gonna when he dies it's just gonna pull a random card out of your d deck and put it in your hand so it's interesting it's not crazy i think if you're doing davriel's offers and conditions i don't know that i would pick a manor guardian maybe if you don't have any manor guardians in your deck you would pick the some conjure manor guardian, but as is, I think you should play um, manor guardians if you're mono black. I'm not sure it fits anywhere else, really. Maybe a Golgari deck, um, just so you can pull some of those. I know. For me, I'm always looking for new ways to find Finn the Fangbearer. And he's two mana or less, so you might be able to pull a random Finn the Fang Bear and change the outcome of a game, which is interesting. He might fit in a Golgari deck. I'm not sure I would play him in anything else. Definitely none of my other black uh, mixed decks. So the next one is interesting, which speaking of Golgari is this guy's a must for a Golgari deck. Plague Crafter is familiar. So most rats in black in Magic the Gathering history have always been one mana. There's a lot of one mana creatures. There's a handful of really good one mana creatures with death touch. And there's a lot of people who like playing rats decks. But Plague Crafter is familiar is one in a black. 
So he's twice as much as almost every other rat you're ever going to have. Except for legendary rats. Um, he's a 1-1, one, one, so that's standard. He has death touch, which is also standard. And then, when Plague Crafts, Crafters Familiar enters the battlefield, you get to choose a creature in your hand, and it perpetually gains death touch for the rest of the game. Just for playing this guy. So in my Golgari deck, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Where is it? My Golgari deck, I have four... Come on, servers. I have four Typhoid Rats, by default. Oh, my thing's in the way. Uh, and I don't have my game up. So this is my Golgari deck. Uh, I have four Typhoid Rats by default. They're one mana. They're one one with Death Touch. I also have four Blight, Blight Blades, which are the exact same thing, but in green. I have a couple uh, Moss Vipers, which are again the exact same thing in green, but these are rotating out, so I, I will need to change those. Um, and so Typhoid Rats are pretty standard in black. They're really standard in Golgari because they all have Death Touch. But now, I could put any other one mana creatures in my Golgari deck, because if I were to play this Plague Crafters Familiar, I can just give something else Death Touch. I don't have to worry about ensuring that everything in my Golgari deck has Death Touch. Because this guy's giving it up for free. I mean, for one extra mana, I guess. But who wouldn't pay one extra mana to give something else death touch? I do that every day of the week. So the last black new to mana card is Subversive Acolyte. He's two black, a black black. Human creature with who's 2-2 two -two power over toughness. His abilities are... Wow, I cannot see that. Why won't it let... Like, it's kind of... When I click on the image, it brings up an image the exact same size. Give me something better. Uh, okay. Oh, my browser went away. Hello. There we go. I'm going to zoom in to read it, and I'll zoom back out so you can see it. Oh, wait. Did I just change the way it was formatted? I did. Hold on. I could just recrop this. Actually, you know what? Can I zoom this in so it's just one on top of each other? Yeah, but that's way too big, right? Blech. Okay, fuck it. Oh my god. What is going on? What is going on? I broke it. We were doing so well. Oh, there we go. Uh, ha, ha. <clears throat> okay, is this, does this work? A little tricky to see. Okay, there we go. That's that's pretty good. Okay, so we're on subversive acolyte. So he's a black black for human creature, two two power toughness. You can tap, not not tap. You pay two mana, and you pay two life to choose one. Activate only once. So you can only do this once, and it's gonna most likely happen for the rest of the game or exist for the rest of the game. So pay two life and two mana to choose one, activate only once. 
subversive one of, your first option is subversive acolyte becomes a human cleric and it gets plus one plus two and lifelink forever for the rest of the game your second option is subversive acolyte becomes a phyrexian and gets plus three plus three gains trample and whenever this creature is dealt damage sacrifice that many permanents so however much damage it takes you have to sacrifice that many permanents so your options are <clears throat> i mean you could leave it as a 2-2 two -two forever it's not super exciting um but then you pay two mana and lose two life and you can either choose a weak creature with lifelink and by weak i mean like it becomes a, a three four so it's not the weakest and it has lifelink so you're getting three every time it deals damage or you choose the more powerful creature with trample that makes you have to sacrifice a other permanence you control i think that's the 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 tug of war you're playing I guess it would depend on what time in the match you're playing Subversive Acolyte. If I'm if I'm playing Subversive Acolyte in the first couple hands, and it looks like we're gonna go ten rounds, you know the 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 box a match is on, if you will, and I and I want it to have longevity. I want to <clears throat> have some more sustain, some life gain. I'm choosing Human Cleric every time. I want to get the plus one, plus two. I want to get lifelink. It's going to exist forever on this card. So for the rest of the game, I have that option. If I'm playing Subversive Acolyte from my hand near the end of the game, and I want to get in the one last swing, if I'm shooting for the moon, swinging for the fences, whatever astrological or sports reference you want to use, I'm playing, I'm choosing the Phyrexian ability because it gets 3-3 and trample and, you know, nine times out of ten, that's, that's spelling lethal damage if you're playing it near the end of a game. But I think uh, there's not a lot of cards like Subversive Acolyte where my mindset or the strategy you have in playing it changes depending on the time frame. There, there's a lot of cards you have to consider what order to play them in, but this on its own, you have to decide. I think it depends greatly at which stage of the match you're in when you play it, which choice you make. So that's it for the new to magic black cards. So we're gonna move on to red. Our first one is Mana Gorger Phoenix. It's two red for, oh, can I zoom out a little bit more? Get the whole card on there. Blech. Scroll up half a tick. Okay, whatever. That's fine. So it's two red for a creature Phoenix. Two, two power toughness. And it has fly. Interestingly, Mana Gorger Phoenix cannot block. However, Whenever you cast a spell, if Mana Gorger Phoenix is in your graveyard, put a flame counter on Mana Gorger Phoenix for each red mana in that spell's mana cost. So, Reckless Ringleader here, you would put one flame counter. If Mana Gorger Phoenix has five or more flame counters on it, return it to the battlefield and it perpetually gets plus one, plus one. So it's literally a phoenix rising from the ashes. And that's really cool. <laughs> I don't play red decks generally. Um, but but that's really interesting. I really like that. I've got a few cards. I, I have a... I have some wish cards, some genie cards that have wish counters on them. I like to play Instrument of the Bards, which has... Um, Oh, what do they call them on Instrument of the Bards? 
you put you you put a musical note counter every time you do your upkeep and those those kind of cards where the flavor text is kind of telling the story about the card is really interesting and the powers that those that flavor text gives you is is something to to marvel at i commend and applaud some of the designers at magic sometimes because of the cool things they come up with um so that's really cool and every time it does that it perpetually gets plus one plus one so the second tilt the first time it rises from the ashes it's a three three and the second time it rises from the ashes it's a four four and it's really cheap it's only two red mana and you can just keep returning it from the ashes it needs five what is it five or more flame counters so you need to spend five or more red mana on spells or creatures instants whatever which i mean give it a turn right maybe one turn and you spent five mana so very intriguing i think that's for creature decks for aggro red decks that's almost a must i think there's not a lot of synergy with other cards but other cards help this card come back to life and i think that's cool and then we've got a new goblin rogue reckless ringleader is one red or a one one goblin rogue which goblin decks always get in love and rogue which is kind of neat but it's red so i'm not using them goblin reckless ringleader has haste and whenever reckless ringleader enters the battlefield choose a creature card in your hand it perpetually gains haste so that's cool just like uh some of these older uh cards we were talking about the plague crafters familiar perpetually gives another card death touch um mentor of evil's isle perpetually gives another card flying reckless ringleader does the same thing except for it gives another card haste for the rest of the game and aggro red decks love haste it's their favorite word just say haste out loud to them and they shudder a little bit they get the shivers down their spine so next up is sarkin scorn which is interesting because sarkin is over here so we haven't learned about sarkin yet should have ordered this differently didn't they do that with yeah they had davriel and then davriel's withering but it's not a thing about making follow the same patterns okay sarkon scorn is two and a red for an instant sarkon scorn deals damage equal to the number of turns you have begun to target creature or planeswalker so this is something the reason why something like this is never going to well i shouldn't say never because who knows what they're going to do the reason why something like this is unlikely to ever make it into paper magic is because it gives players another thing they have to keep track of how many turns you've started so every time you have an upkeep after you've played this or every time you have an upkeep if you have this in your deck you have to keep track of how many turns you play if you're keeping track of how many turns you play and how many upkeeps you've had and someone sees you someone sitting across the table from you and they see that you're keeping track of your upkeeps they probably know what card you have so it's not a surprise they can see it coming and they'll probably hold on to a counter spell because i would um and it just gives you another thing you have to keep track of which you know we don't want to do ever we don't even like keeping track of our own life sometimes it's not a thing about making it anyway <laughs> the next one up is sarkin wanderer to shiv <laughs> which is really cool um he's got fucking dragon hands which seems kind of painful he's a legendary planeswalker costs three and a red he's got a base loyalty of four. Oh, i wish i could just oh there we go i got it um legendary planeswalker sarkan his plus one ability is dragon cards in your hand perpetually gain this spell costs one less to cast 
and you may pay X rather than pay its spell's mana cost, where X is the man is its mana value. What? You may pay X rather than pay its this spell's mana cost, where X is its mana value. Why? Okay, that's confusing. Um, his my, his zero ability is conjure a shivan dragon to your hand for free every single turn that this guy is alive you can put a dragon card in your hand now I don't know that a shivan dragon is something you want to have a bunch of uh, let me see a shivan dragon is 4 and 2 red so it's a 6 mana 5-5 five, five with flying not a terrible card don't that's not what i'm getting at but you don't want to keep putting six mana cost cards into your hand so maybe this is a game ender conjure a shiv and dragon play it on your next turn or start your upkeep and then use his zero ability before you spend any mana get that shiv and dragon and cast it right away if you have a uh, reckless ringleader enter the battlefield before it, which is only one red mana, then Shivan Dragon gets haste too. So that's that's an interesting combo there. A free dragon card. It does cost six mana to to cast it, but it was free. And because it's a actual planeswalker ability and not uh, an ETB or anything like that, you can choose when to do it. His minus two ability is Sarkhan the Wanderer to Shiv deals three damage to target creature. So, okay, this is a little nuts, actually. He's mythic rare, so hopefully he's not going to be played in every deck. Um, actually, hold on one sec. I just have to run to the washroom. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, drinking too much coffee. So, 
Sarkin is pretty beefy. He's a beefy boy. And there's some really interesting synergies here. If you do a bunch of plus ones uh, for a few turns, and then you can do some minus twos every turn, you get a free dragon, blah, blah, blah. He's scary. The next red new to magic card in the Jumpstart Historic Horizon set is Scion of Shiv. He's two mana, a, a red red, for a 3-3 three, three dragon with flying. And his ability is two and a red, and Scion of Shiv perpetually gets plus one, plus zero. So this is interesting if you've got a buttload of mana and you want to um, you know, beef this guy up over the course of a game. If you've got some, maybe some graveyard um, synergy with your red deck um, if you've got if you've got four mana to play him and then three mana to buff him so seven mana total you can immediately put him on the battlefield and make him a four three and then your next turn when he's ready to attack you can make him a five three and attack with flying five in the air which is pretty crazy I don't, oh welcome to the hamlet I don't know why that replayed. Okay. So that's pretty cool. I like that. It's a little bit of a weaker dragon, a little bit of a cheaper dragon too, but you can buff it perpetually. This one little dragon could mean a win or loss, depending on how much you buff him over the course of one game. The last new to magic red card is Static Discharge. For one and a red, it's a sorcery. So you can only play it during your turn. Static Discharge deals X damage to any target where X is three plus the number of charge counters on Static Discharge. Then put a perpetual charge counter on this card and each card name Static Discharge in your hand, library, and graveyard. So this is really intriguing because um, Charge counters is another new mechanic to Arena, and it's going to be digital only, I believe. And so say you have a, a standard deck and you've got four static discharges in your deck. So every single time you play a static discharge, the next static discharge you play will be more powerful. And if you can pull sorceries out of your graveyard, you can just continuously grow the power of your static discharge because static gains strength or um, electricity. It gains static with more use, with more static generation. So this is another one of those instances where Wizards of the Coast is using flavor text and um, real life attributions to make something make sense. So if you've got a full set of four of these and you play one, so two, uh, it costs one mana, one colorless mana and a red, so two mana, the first one deals three damage. And then you put a, um, a static, a charge counter on all your other static discharge cards, which again, the only reason, the reason why this is a digital only mechanic is because it's very difficult to keep track of static counters or charge counters in real life paper magic. The second one you cast will again still only be a one and a red to, to cast, but it will deal three plus X and X is the amount of static or charge counters on your static discharge. So your second one is gonna do four damage. And then once you cast that one, all your other static discharges get another charge counter. So your third one is gonna do five damage. And if you have a full play set and you're running four static discharges and you're lucky enough to get all four of them in a game, your fourth one is gonna deal five damage. So all of a sudden you've got a three, oh, wait, no. The first one is three, the second one is four, the third one is five, and then the last one is six. Yeah. 
So that's really interesting because it just gradually builds. The power of these um, sorceries grow over over use, which is super cool. I think that's 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 definitely a game ender. You could take out by the end of the game, if you've played three static discharges already, your fourth one is going to deal six damage. So you can take out a pretty powerful creature, um, and that could sway the game for you. <clears throat> Pardon me. The last one we have, uh, last one, yeah, the last color we have is green. And again, these are new to magic cards in the Jumpstart Historic Horizons set that is only coming to Arena and is not coming to Paper Magic. We will get to the new Paper Magic stuff in a minute. The first green new to magic card is Freyalise Sky Shroud Partisan. It's one, a green green for a legendary planeswalker with four, um, four loyalty counters by default. Her plus one ability is untap up to one target elf. That elf and a random elf creature card in your hand get plus one plus one. So this is an obvious go-to immediately for an elf deck. So you're going to be buffing an elf of your choice, a tapped elf, hopefully, so that you can maximize this. So I would attack with my elves after the combat phase in your second main phase. I would plus one Freya Lease, untap one of those elves, and it gets a plus one plus one. And then one of the random elves in your hand, which again the computer will choose at random, will also get a plus one plus one, so that when it enters the battlefield, um, it is stronger as well. And you can keep doing this every turn, do the plus one. For minus one, you seek an elf card. So again, Everything about this card is an absolute must for elf decks. This is fantastic. Minus one, seek an elf card. So again, seek is pull a random card out of your deck that has elf in the creature type. If you're running a creature, or if you're running an elf deck and all of your creatures have elf creature types, it's just going to pick one of your creatures. It could be the best elf in your deck, it could be the worst elf in your deck, but it's going to pull an elf card, which is fantastic. If, say you want it to be a little bit smarter, um, or maximize this a little bit better, and you don't care about the plus one. So in this scenario, the plus one isn't as powerful because say, say you only have one elf card in your deck. I don't know what deck that looks like. Or, or why that situation would ever arise. But say you only have one really powerful elf card in your deck and you play Freya Lise, and you immediately seek an elf card. Because it picks an elf card at random from your deck, if you only have one, you know exactly what card it's gonna find. And that's pretty crazy. You can automatically summon the most powerful the, the card that you've designed this deck to to uh, pull from your library. Her ultimate ability, her minus six, is you conjure a regal force card onto the battlefield. Uh, we don't have regal force on this list, so let me look it up real quick. Regal force. Uh, yes, I agree. Regal Force is... Oh, wait. Did that say Battlefield or... Oh, yeah. Conjure a Regal Force card onto the battlefield. You'll have to do plus one twice, at least. You could do it three times or whatever. Um, and if you have that weird edge case scenario where you only have one elf card, that matters a little bit less. But you need to get it up to six loyalties so that you can do its ultimate ability which is conjure a regal force straight onto the battlefield. And the reason why that's powerful is because regal force is four green, green, green. So it's seven mana. It's an elemental creature, five, five. When regal force enters the battlefield, draw a card for each green creature you control. So even if you're not running elves and you're just mono green, say you're mono green stompy or mono green plus one, plus one, 
Regal Force is going to do some do some good because if you have one green creature on your battlefield, you get to draw a free card. If you have two, yada, yada, yada. You could draw a handful of cards and reset the game, if you will. And you, it goes straight onto the battlefield for free. That's a pretty cool card. She's also a mythic. Um, and I think, again, for elf, for elf decks, absolute must. Absolute must. You can seek an elf. You untap elves, you buff elves, and it's perpetual buffs. Absolute must for elf decks. The next green new to magic card is Long Tusk Stalker, who is one mana, one green, for a 1 1 creature cat. Whenever Long Tusk Stalker enters the battlefield or attacks, you get a charge counter. You can pay two charge counters, and Long Tusk Stalker perpetually gets plus one, plus zero. You may choose a creature card in your hand. If you do, that card also gets perpetu perpetually gets plus one, plus zero. So, what you want is to have more than one Long Tusk Stalker in your hand, or not in your hand, in your library, in your deck. So a full playset, four of them. And every single time you pay, every single time they enter the battlefield, so with your one green mana, you get a charge counter. Two of those charge counters perpetually buffs plus one, or perpetually buffs Long Tusk Stalker and another card that you have in your hand. Or you could run a system where you're constantly playing Long Tusk Stalker, pulling it from the battlefield back into your hand and keep taking advantage of its enter the battlefield power. I think that's a really interesting mechanic. The next one is a pool of vigorous growth, which is one and a green for an artifact. You pay X and tap to discard a card, create a token that's a copy of a random creature card with mana value X. Activate only as a sorcery. So you can activate this only at, uh, on your turn during one of your main phases. So this is interesting because there's a couple of cards. I mentioned, uh, pardon me, my mouth is really dry. I haven't talked to this much in a very long time. Um, I spoke about the instrument of the bards earlier, and that is a card where every upkeep, you can choose to put a harmony counter on it. And then um, at any point during your turn, you can spend those harmony counters to find a card that has a mana value of the amount of harmony counters on your instrument of bards. Which is a really powerful tool, especially if you remember the am amount, the mana cost of the card you really want. So I have an endless um, enigma, I believe it's called, in my... Uh, Simic deck and so he costs six mana and so whenever I get the opportunity to play instrument of the bards I'm always trying to remember six in my head I get the instrument of the bards up to six counters and then I can find this powerful card in my deck for for free and pool of vigorous growth is sort of like that except for you have to have the mana available it's not something you can build counters on. So for one and a green, you cast this artifact, and then at any time, so your next turn, five turns from now, you pay X amount of mana. So if we're talking about my endless enigma, I would pay six mana to tap this and find a random card in my deck with mana value X. Hopefully I don't have a lot of six mana cards, so I get the card I'm looking for. Otherwise, I mean, I would do this once a turn. I would pay, if you're not paying a, playing a counter deck, if you don't have any counter cards in your hand and you're not looking to keep mana on the board uh, when you pass your turn, I would play this with whatever mana you've got left over. It's gonna find a random creature card in your deck with the same mana value that you paid in order to cast this, and it's gonna put it into your hand um, create a token that's... Oh, it's not going to put it into your hand. It's going to be on the battlefield. 
because it's a token. So it's going to copy a random card in your deck. So that's interesting because it's tokens. You can cast it over and over and over again. Um, the only downside to it that I can see is that it's random. So you have a little bit less control. Um, whether or not the creature that you copy is a game changer or anything of the sort is completely random. It's, it's, you, you're not going to be able to tell whether or not this move is going to change the, the outcome of the game yet. It's, it's fun. Randomization is fun. It's definitely not a competitive card. I'll play this card if you're playing magic to have fun, not necessarily to win. The next green card is Sky Shroud Ambush. For one and a green, it's an instant. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. When the creature you control wins the fight, draw a card. So this is kind of like Rabid Bite, which is a standard in a lot of green aggro decks, which forces um, one of your creatures to fight one of your opponent's creatures. This does the exact same thing, except... If your creature is the one who wins the fight, uh, you get to draw a card. And I think Rabid Bite is the same mana cost. Yeah, one and a green. So this is the exact same thing, but if you win, which you should win because you get to decide who fights who, you get to draw a card. So it's an upgrade, upgraded Rabbit Bite. The next one is Sky Shroud Lookout, which is one and a green for an elf archer who's a 1-1 one, one with reach. Big old longbow. Or maybe that's a composite bow. It's hard to tell because she's in a Superman pose. Um... Her ability is whenever Sky Shroud Lookout enters the battlefield, seek an elf. So much like um, Freya Elise up here, where you can pay minus one to seek an elf, pull an elf card from your deck at random. Uh, you get to do that with Sky Shroud Lookout as when she enters the battlefield. So if you've got a few of these cards in your hand, you get some free creatures into your hand just by playing this one. For one and a green, that's pretty good. Um, if you have a system where you can constantly pull Sky Shroud Lookout from the battlefield back into your hand, you can conjure as many elves as you have the mana to cast Sky Shroud Lookout. And then, thanks to Freya Lise, if you've got her on the board, you can buff those elves, untap those elves, and do general elf shenanigans, which elf players love to do. The last green card in this new to magic list for modern or not modern horizons jumpstart historic horizons which is the magic arena only update coming out um, next week is veteran charger for two and a green you get a centaur soldier two two not bad three mana two two whenever veteran charger enters the battlefield Choose a creature card in your hand to perpetually get plus two, plus two. So that's really cool. I kind of wish I could choose to put the two, two on veteran charger because a three mana two, two creature isn't anything to get excited about, but choosing a creature to perpetually get a two and a buff is something that's worth the mana cost. But the fact that you have to pick a card that's in your hand makes it a little less exciting. But I still think it's uh, it's pretty good. You're probably not going to want to play this in an elf deck uh, because it's a centaur. But there's a lot of upside to that. If you have something really powerful in your hand, um, say a 7-6 a or, or a 6-6 six, six or a 5-5 five, five dragon even... Um, you play Veteran Charger and then give that game ending card a little bit more of a buff so it's more of a threat. And you'll probably get some GG's and 
concedes out of Arena. So the last thing we're going to look at is one colorless card that's new to mana. Oh, new to mana. Wow. Maybe Saturday morning magic isn't the right idea. Maybe I'm too tired. Well, we won't be going over cards every Saturday. So there's one new colorless card in to, new to magic in the Jumpstart Historic Horizons, and that's Faceless Agent. For three mana, you get a Shapeshifter, a 2-1 power over toughness, and it's a Changeling, which means that it's every and all creature type. When Faceless Agent enters the battlefield, seek a creature card of the most prevalent creature type in your library. So again, this is something that is going to be digital only because knowing the prevalency of creature types in your deck isn't something that everybody keeps track of. It's something that I keep track of, but that's because I like building decks a lot. Um, I keep track of a lot of things while I'm building those decks, one of them being my most prevalent creature type. Um, but when you play this in Arena, it's going to look at your whole deck behind the behind the curtains it's going to figure out which is the most prevalent creature type say you're running an elf deck and you've got some other creatures sprinkled in there it's going to pick elf because you have the most elves and it will bring one of those elves randomly into your hand uh no into the battle no seek a creature card of the most prevalent creature type in your library so seek goes into your hand yeah so for three mana, you cast this 2-1, which is every creature type. So he'll count towards elves if you're making an elf deck. And you get to seek a creature card of the most prevalent card type, creature type in your library, which is pretty cool. Um, I think that's pretty powerful. I don't know that it would belong in every deck. I would probably play it in my rogues deck in fact, because then I can pull a random rogue. Which would be interesting. And he counts as a rogue, so any of my rogue buffs will buff him as well. I I really like that. Overall, I think... Um, what are... I made some choices the other day. But my most exciting... Um... Hold on, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Fast forward. There we go. So my picks for the best cards or my favorite cards in Jumpstart Historic Horizons, new to magic, are Evos, who gives... Oh, my bad. The Mentor of Evos Isle. Because... When they enter the battlefield, you give another card flying. So you don't have to worry about having all flying creatures because you can perpetually give another creature flying for the rest of the game. Um, it's fairly cheap on mana. It's got two power flying, so two power through the air. I just like this card, especially if I'm playing uh, blue decks and I want to ensure that I have... I want to not disclude a card because it doesn't have flying if I'm trying to aim for a lot of power in the air. I think this um, can make a big difference. My second choice for the best and or favorite card in this set is Playcraft is Familiar. Now much to the chagrin of everybody I've ever partnered or matched up with on Standard Ranked, much to the chagrin of my partner playing at home on the kitchen table. I love Death Touch. I love Golgari decks. It is probably my second favorite game type playstyle in all of Magic. Um, it is my most successful ranked record. It is the most fun to play. Um, and Playcraft is familiar Familiar not only has Death Touch, which I need and want in my uh, Fang Bear deck, but it gives something else that doesn't have Death Touch, Death Touch. So again, like uh, Mentor of the Evos Isles, I don't have to worry that my entire deck list is made up of 
cards that have death touch because if there's a card I want more than um, a Tarush, Tajuru Blight Blade or a Moss Viper or Typhoid Rats even if there's a card I'd rather have say um, a Neverwinter Dryad that gives me one green mana for a tap I could give that non-death touch creature death touch so it acts the exact same as a blight blade a uh, typhoid rat a boss viper all these one one chump blockers um this just adds an extra element to it so i think that's very exciting i am putting a full set a full play set of plague crafters familiars in my golgari deck on arena day one without a doubt my third choice for the best and or favorite of the new to magic cards in Jumpstart Historic Horizons is Faceless Agent. We talked about it a bit at the end there. Uh, Faceless Agent is really intriguing because I like to play... Most of my decks are centered around tribes. So I like playing elf decks. I like playing... Um, dryad decks or druid decks or creature decks of the same um, tribe. My Demir Rogues deck, Demir is my favorite um, in game group. It's my favorite deck to play, it's my favorite deck to manage, it's my favorite deck to build, it's my favorite setting. So I love rogues and I have a million rogue cards and being able to have not only faceless agent count as a rogue because it's a changeling, but it will also seek a creature card of your most prevalent creature card type from your library. So you play a rogue and you get a rogue and it's three colorless mana. It's just worth it across the board. If you're playing a tribes deck or you're playing something where tribe creature type matters, Faceless Agent is a great card. And I think we're gonna see a lot of it in Arena. And my last choice for favorite and or best cards in this new set is Kiora. Now, I want to love blue as much as all of the mono blue players do. I don't always, but I love sea creatures, I love krakens, I love merfolk. I love this whole vibe that blue always has. The control aspect of playing a blue deck is very fun. It's frustrating for the other person, but it's very fun to play. And Kiora is not only an epic character, an epic card, it's the perfect planeswalker for a blue creatures deck because you get to conjure krakens, you get to untap lands, you get to prevent damage, and then her ultimate ability is sacrificing krakens to make an 8-8 blue kraken. So you can have a 1-1 kraken tentacle, sacrifice it, and get an 8-8. You're looking at like turn five or six, and you have an 8-8 on the battlefield. And that's going to be GG in a lot of cases. So I think for people who play, play blue creatures, for people who play um, blue decks with, you know, mitigating control, but not all control, I think Kiora is an absolute bombshell. I think for those who have Kraken decks, and I know that there's only a few Kraken players out there, um, I think Kiora is an absolute must. I really wish this card was coming to Paper Magic. It is not, but I will have to create a deck around her because this card is epic. And that is my... That is my thoughts on the new to Magic um, Jumpstart Historic Horizons. That's coming to Arena only on the 12th of August. Now I'm going to go get a coffee and take a washroom break. And then I might play a couple rounds.